Good morning and welcome to a special town hall meeting. All of the candidates are vying for the MP seat in order to represent Victoria are here in the studio, save for one, and that is Arlo from the Libertarian Party. I want to just clear this up. Uh, Arlo is sick, unfortunately he cannot be with us today. He asked for his campaign manager to step in, but we decided since this was an all-candidates forum and not an all-party forum, that it would not be fair to the other candidates. We offered Mr. Lowe the opportunity to provide a statement that we would read in the program today. He has declined to do that, saying that uh, if he couldn't debate or his team could not debate, that they would decline our invitation. So we will not be hearing from Art Lowe today from the Libertarian Party. However, uh, we obviously will mention his name and encourage you to consider his name on the ballot uh, when you vote on Monday. By the way, just a note on voting, it's 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times throughout the day. We just want to make sure that, that nobody shows up at the polls at uh, 7.30, thinking it's an 8 o'clock close. So please do remember, it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And as Elections Canada has put out, should the polling place change, they do not call individuals. Uh, and uh, tell them that the polling place has changed. We're going to put that out there just in case something strange should happen. We know that that course would never happen in Victoria. <laughs> so uh, we have the other five candidates uh, in the studio uh, here in the live studio audience. We're taking your calls for the candidates. The number to call 250-386-1161, star 1070 on your cell, or you can send us an email talk at cfax1070.com. We welcome your questions and the issues that you really want to put to the candidates that are running to be MP, replacing Denise Savoy, who recently resigned. We have the candidates sitting uh, beside me on both sides, and um, although you're obviously not going to see that on radio, but uh, for the folks here, uh, just a little bit of a formality, we've set them in alphabetical order. That's how you're going to hear their opening statements this morning. We're going to give them one minute, and first up, we're going to uh, introduce to you, good morning to Dale Gann from the Conservative Party. Good morning. Good morning. We have one minute to make an opening statement. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm... Uh, Born and raised in this lovely city. I was born here in 1968, a fourth generation member of this community. For the past 10 years, I've totally dedicated my life to working in the knowledge economy and creating jobs. For the past 10 years of my life, I've worked with industry, academia, governments of all colors, governments of all levels, with the true focus of helping strengthen our economy, with the focus of helping keep our kids here working, with the focus of building companies that offer jobs. I believe this by-election is an opportunity. Governments create environments for us. Governments create opportunities for us. It's up to us as a region, it's up to Victoria to create a plan for us to work within that environment. And I want to be part of that voice in Ottawa for you. I look forward to this morning's debate. Fantastic. That uh, is Dale Gann from the Conservative Party. Thanks for staying with us for a minute. Appreciate it. Now moving on to the Green candidate uh, running in this race. Uh, good morning to Donald Galloway. Good morning, Donald. Good morning. The question that arises in this debate this morning is whether you can trust us to represent your interests well in Parliament. I think that there are three reasons for trusting me to be your next MP. First of all, I have the experience to advocate on behalf of those who have no voice or little voice in, in Parliament. I will represent you strongly because that's what I've been doing over the last few years for others. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not a lawyer that takes clients. I'm a lawyer that pursues causes, and that's what I will do for social groups within, par within Parliament, social groups re representing the needy of Victoria. The second reason for trusting me is I've linked myself to the most popular politician in Canada, the Parliamentarian of the Year, Elizabeth May. Elizabeth May and I have worked together closely. Thirdly, I have a sense of what it is to be a successful MP. I don't have to re reply to a party leader. I have to reply directly to you. Thank you very much, Don Galloway. Now we move to the candidate running for the Christian Heritage Party, and that is Philip May. Good morning, Philip. The mayor of Victoria, I have to thank you, CFAC, for including me in three major meetings. I was going to be excluded, so my hat is off to my colleagues who insisted I was part of this. And indeed, I am part of this. I have practiced in Victoria since 1968. 
I have taught in five medical schools in various parts of the world. I've started up SALTS that many people know, it now hurts, and I have been on the school board, most in college council. I am against bigger government, I am against more taxes, I am against globalization, and Agenda 21, that most people don't know about it, it's about depopulation, that much of our government is supporting. And you better be aware of that, I am for more children, because we have to have more children if we're going to have a growing economy. You cannot run a free market economy without increasing population. And so depopulation is the wrong way to go, and I am much against it. And all my colleagues, they want more funding. You're not going to get more funding. Our country is broke, and we're going into debt. Thank you. Now we move on to the candidate running for the new Democratic Party, and that is Murray Rankin. At one minute. Good morning, Murray. Thank you very much for having me. I'm the NDP candidate. Uh, I've lived in this community for 35 years. I hope to succeed Denise Savoie, who was such an excellent member uh, for this riding. Uh, my main issue is standing up to Mr. Harper's reckless agenda, both in respect of environment, cutbacks to social programs, the China investment deal, and in particular the Enbridge Northern Gateway project, which I think most Victorians utterly reject. I want to be part of the largest uh, opposition, official opposition in 30 years and stand up every day to Mr. Harper in the House of Commons. I'm an environmental activist and an environmental lawyer, and I believe I have the skills necessary to do the job. Thank you very much. Roy. That is a short this morning. Just by the way, I just want to clear up any confusion uh, to Philip and anybody else listening today that Philip's comments about including him in the event today, by the way, actually came from CFAX 1070 and CTV. We wanted to ensure that everybody was included <coughs> in this all candidates meeting, so we, uh, we didn't want to exclude anybody. We now move to our final candidate making their one minute uh, opening statement, running for the Liberal Party of Canada. Say good morning, please, to Paul Somerville. Paul. Good morning, Victoria. My name is Paul Somerville. I'm the federal Liberal candidate uh, in this uh, election. I'm an adjunct professor uh, at uh, the University of Victoria, and I'm against uh, the Enbridge pipeline. Uh, but I'm trying to stop the secondary sewage treatment plant, what I call the billion dollar boondoggle from being built. And the reason is simple. My campaign has been based on one single issue, uh, and that is that public policy needs to be evidence-based, it needs to be scientifically and fiscally responsible. And the reality is that the billion dollar boondoggle, which is being imposed by the Harper government and supported by the NDP, is fiscally irresponsible and provides no net environmental benefit. But what I pick up at the doorsteps over the last four or five weeks is the terrible impact this is gonna have on families and businesses in Victoria as the sewage tax prices families and businesses out of our great city. A vote for me is to stop the secondary sewage treatment plan. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. Uh, five candidates uh, making their opening statements in addition to the candidate that is not here with us today. Uh, Oglo from the Libertarian Party. We'll take a quick break. When we come back to our town hall meeting, we are going to discuss one of the issues in the news today, the, con the uh, Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Victoria coming out and saying they support, this is uh, their words, they support sewage treatment. You're listening to a live town hall meeting with candidates running for MP in Victoria. I'm Stephen. On CFAX 1070. We have five of the six candidates running to be the next uh, MP in Victoria in the studio. I said that we were going to talk about uh, sewage when we come back. This seems to be a big, uh, big issue. Not only uh, is it uh, on the minds of our candidates, but obviously on the minds of tourism. Victoria and the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce today, they've come out in support of sewage treatment. Now, this next part of the uh, debate, I mean, I want to shake it up a little bit. I don't want it to be stayed. I'm going to ask a question of one of you. About 20 seconds uh, to an answer, and after 20 seconds, uh, please feel free to jump in and discuss it amongst yourself, and I will try to moderate. Uh, the other thing I would ask is that you please don't jump out of your chairs and uh, punch the other guy. You know, we're going to keep this very friendly and fun. It's been like this morning. Again, if you would like to join the conversation, we will get to your calls as soon as we can at 2503861161. So, um, it's been quite a race in the past couple of days. I mean, uh, Murray Rankin, you have been uh, endorsed by a giant walking turd. I don't know if that's uh, uh, a plus or a minus. You are you you appear to be obviously solely in support of this, going along with the, the folks at the chamber and tourism Victoria. Um, are you hearing any difference once you've gone into this campaign that this may not be a good, such a good idea now? 
You know, I've been very pleased to see the Georgia Strait Alliance, the David Suzuki Foundation, Eco Justice Sierra Club, the environmental community agreeing it's time to get on with secondary treatment. But I, I was particularly buoyed as well, as you said earlier, that the Chamber of Commerce in this community, I spoke to uh, Bruce Carter yesterday, and Tourism Victoria have come on board in agreement that it's time to do the secondary treatment job. So yes, I think it is time to do so. And yet, your, one of your opponents, which is uh, Paul Somerville, has made this his campaign. And you know what, uh, Paul, I have to ask you, if you get elected on Monday uh, and uh, manage to delay this thing uh, in the past couple of weeks, then what are you going to do for the next uh, rest of your term? Well, of course, as you know, Stephen, uh, I've attended all the 11 uh, debates that we've had. Uh, if you go to my website, you see that what this campaign about is about is that public policy is based on evidence and not ideology. Uh, we've advocated for the legalization, regulation, commercialization, and taxation of marijuana. We've advocated for an annual, a guaranteed annual income. We've advocated against mandatory sentencing. We've advocated against the Enbridge Pipeline. We've advocated against the trade uh, deal with China. There are lots and lots of things we've been talking about. It's not Paul Somerville. It's the people of Victoria that have made this mad plan, the billion dollar boondoggle, the number one issue of this campaign. That's what's happened. So this, this uh, job that we're applying for is, is critical cardinal role, that you listen to your citizens and you never lose sight of uh, representing their voices. And you do it in a way that you look at it financially, environmentally, scientifically, and socially. What we've heard and what we know is that the citizens and the scientists say Mother Nature's looking after it. What we hear and what we know is they're saying that we cannot look after it forever. I've not met one person that wants to pollute the beautiful streets and want to do that. But, you know, I mean, Dalian, I have to say to you, though, that this seems to be opposite to what your party is doing. Where is your party on this? Why would not hear anything from Stephen Harper, your leader? I mean, other uh, MPs for the other parties have been in uh, supporting their positions. Where, where has the party been supporting your position? About a year ago, I presented to the Western Economic Diversification uh, Minister for Federal Government that this region and any region in Canada must approve revenue enhancing infrastructure projects and projects as well as cost ones. We have to look after our backyard. Five weeks ago, I was the president of a tech park. Now I'm uh, running as a candidate in a, in a by election to represent the voice of Victoria. I have made Ottawa aware of my position. But Dale, what, what do they say? What do they say? What do they say? Yeah, do they support you? They have, my, my position has been heard and it's been considered. But Dale, your yeah. position is absolutely irresponsible. You stood up for four weeks in front of public audiences and you were the biggest advocate for this plan and then you magically discovered the science as your campaign was being attacked by your own party members. You foolishly flipped. The so reality is, the reality is, is that you didn't know the science when you entered this campaign. I would like to jump to in. say that the scientists are, I could jump in please, Martin. I think that uh, a week ago today, uh, I was being briefed by the CRD. Sitting in with me in the room was Dr. Andrew Weaver and Elizabeth May. The three of us decided that we would take a joint stance on this, pro on this problem. I would much prefer to have our local Nobel laureate uh, on my side than Mr. Floaty. The, the position that Andrew Weaver has stated in his Facebook page is that there is something deeply problematic about our uh, proposal. If the most serious issue is the flow of contaminants into our pipelines, then the current proposal only deals with 50% of those contaminants. If that's the concern, then we have only got a partial solution that is costing a fortune. Let me uh, just, so uh, I, I will get to everyone who said thank you, Don Galloway. Let's just go to Mary Rankin. Well, well, to, well, to suggest that the scientists are all of one view is, is patently false. David Suzuki is a scientist who came out and agreed today that we need to get on with it. No, in true. addition, not there, true. to get on with the treatment, to no longer, in his words, use our ocean as a dump. Those were the words he used. But the predication, this entire decision of the provincial government was predicated on science. We've had scientists since 2006 studying this. There's a number of reports to suggest unanimity in the scientific community is patently false. So, Mark, Rankin, why don't, Mark Rankin, why don't we wait just a little bit longer and see if we can get some consensus been, about, get some consensus among the scientists. Getting consensus among scientists is like getting a consensus amongst economists. So what you're saying is those, are you saying then, Murray, that those who are pro sewage treatment uh, the only ones with the correct Absolutely. Opinion. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is a dissonant, dissonant difference of opinion without doubt on the science, but the science that, on which this is based is clear. Philip it's May. clear for a community of pragmatism. 
I am a skipper, sail on that water, I'm a scuba diver, I dive in that water, I'm a physician, I know about bacteria. But what do we do in the country? We have septic tanks, and that is primary and secondary. What comes out of the effluent of a septic tank can go straight into the water. The solids can be used for fertilizer, and it is far less expensive. <laughs> Expecting the federal government to give you money won't happen. So it's a pie in the sky, gentlemen. To say that the science is divided is absolutely untrue, and to say that the science is definitive is untrue. There was a report done in 2006, the CTAC report, which was very clear that the science was unclear, that there was no net benefit uh, from uh, a land-based uh, strategy to deal with our secondary uh, sewage. The reality is there's, a, there's an army of marine biologists, people who love the oceans, public health officials, who have absolutely unequivocal that there's no net benefit from this strategy. Okay, Paul, so I'm now going to go to Dale Gannon, and I'll come back to you. Well, and I find it interesting that we're running again for a job to represent our city and our beautiful region. And Paul, you say to me that you're concerned that I've changed my mind and that I'm being integral to this community. And I, I agree that the science and the engineering community haven't decided how to fix the problem. Why are you happy that I'm doing that? Is this is about Victoria. This is about taxpayers' dollars. I'm concerned that you would you I'm concerned that you would stand up in Victoria. I'm concerned that you would stand up in a public me. debate for four weeks and be an advocate for a mad plan that's going to cost a billion dollars with no net environmental benefit that's going to push businesses and families out of our city, and you okay. didn't know the science. That's let's, what worries me. Let's go to Don Gallo. I think that what the people of Victoria are looking for is leadership here, leadership on a federal level. After our briefing with CRD, Elizabeth May and I decided that should I be elected, the first thing we will do is approach three branches of government to get them on site and to identify some clarity in this situation. DND, can they provide us with land near our heartland? Fisheries and oceans, can they provide us with some breathing space so we don't have to decide immediately? Environment. Can we actually figure out what the, the level of contamination that is appropriate should be? Basically, the people of Victoria don't want us to act as scientists because we are not scientists. Okay, they now want I want to go back down the line again because we just got a couple of minutes. And uh, what I'm going to do is ask each of you, do you think, uh, first, my first question to you is, do you think that we should still treat our sewage? And if not, uh, what should we do? And I need you to be brief because I need to get through everyone down. I'm going to start with you. Yes, we should get on with a plan to treat our sewage, but not this plan. This okay. plan is not right. I agree with that view. I think that this, this plan is a flawed plan. It is an only partially effective, and it has, if we actually adopt this plan to have add-ons later, it will be yeah. impossible and costly. Well, whatever way it is, it's going to increase taxes. We cannot afford to increase taxes. Our country is broke. Increasing taxes in Victoria, people will sell their houses, fewer tax paper, Payers and down the very yeah. old group. Yes, we should get on with secondary treatment. The only city north of San Diego of any size that doesn't. And secondly, I will work with the Capital Regional District to make it the most cost-effective response possible. When someone can show me a 21st century green technology that provides net environmental benefit that's financially responsible, I'm all for it. Okay, there. Hopefully that's uh, done the sewage thing to death uh, on this uh, part of the program. We will be taking your calls when we come back from the news, 250-386-1161, star 1070. You're listening to a special town hall meeting here on CFAX 1070. I'm Steve Andrew. Now, Stephen Andrew on CFAX 1070. Welcome back to our town hall here, live at our CFAX 1070 studios at the corner of Broad and Pandora. Five of the candidates running to represent uh, you in Ottawa are here to take your questions at 250-386-1161, star 1070. Email is up and running at talk at CFAX 1070, and the conversation continues on Twitter at CFAX 1070. We'll get to your calls in just a second. One of the candidates I'd just like to remind you is not here today, Art Lowe, from the Libertarian Party is sick, so you will not be uh, hearing his uh, comments today. But candidates, just before, if you're going to be jumping in, just make sure that you identify yourself, because obviously here in the studio we know who's talking, but uh, at uh, home, in the car, at the work, uh, people are not uh, aware of what's going on. We're going to go to the phones right now. We're going to start things off uh, with uh, Ron. Ron, good morning. Welcome to CPAX 1070. Go ahead with your question and your issue this morning, sir. Thank you very much. Two weeks ago, the Vancouver Sun obtained an internal email from the Federal Fisheries Department 
Chapman that revealed a new organizational chart and a new chart plus the Northern Gateway Liaison position reporting directly to its Executive Director of National Ecosystems Management. Now this document exposes this concern, the Harvard Conservative plan of putting the oil industry ahead of, ahead of BC fishing, tourism, and other coastal industries, as well as our pristine coast. So my question is, given this one secret political agenda, what will your party do to speak for our environment and coastal industries and stop this pipeline and associated oil tanker traffic, which a clear majority of British Columbians and Victorians do not want? Let's uh, start off uh, with Murray Rankin. Murray. I've spent the last year of my life volunteering as the legal advisor to Adrian Dix in the hope that if they become government, we can stop the Enbridge pipeline. I believe that the DFO report to which you refer uh, is frightening. It demonstrates that Mr. what Mr. Oliver has already told us, the, the Federal Minister of Energy, and that is that they believe it's in the national interest. Well, I don't, and I'll stand up against it. Donald Gallagher. The Green Party of Canada in particular, have, are the only, we're the only ones who are actually taking a solid opposition against all transportation of bitumen past our coasts. We're not just concerned about the Enbridge pipeline, we are concerned about the pipeline that will carry bitumen past our coast here in Victoria. Let's go to Dale Gant from the Conservative Party. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to recognize that we're blessed as a nation to have resources. We must learn how to steward them in the most responsible, financial, environmental way. As a citizen, as a candidate, and, and someone that's listened to the doors, yes, people are concerned about the opportunity that it could damage our prestige pipeline, could hurt our coast. But let's listen to the independent body. Let's go forward and have that process completed. Let's all read it. Let's all think about it. And then let's take our collective voice to Ottawa after we've read the document. Let's go to uh, Paul Somerville from the Liberal Party. Well, we need uh, a rigorous uh, regulatory process, and it's pretty clear that the Enbridge pipeline, as I like to say through this campaign, is nuts. Where we differ from the Green Party, we have to remember that the global economy is $60 trillion in size, and the Canadian economy is $1.5 trillion. We have to trade, and one of our strategic assets is resources. We need to be smart about how we regulate tanker traffic and pipelines. We need to be able to think environmentally responsibly about how we harvest our resources and not basically just cut them off. And Philip Nate from the Christian Heritage well, Party. I taught at the University of Hong Kong. I think I understand Chinese. You're playing Chinese chess with a dragon. And I hope you understand we're not in a good position to bargain. We're selling our products at basement prices because the store is going broke. And we gotta do that because of depopulation. Do you support Agenda 21 from the UN? I would like to know what my colleagues think about Agenda 21 from the UN, because the government has signed on to that. Anyone else want to comment on this? We'll go right to the phones again. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to add one more thing. I think, and, and Paul- You're talking about Dale Gann right now. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, Dale Gann. I think it's really important to recognize how important resources are to our economy. They pay for our healthcare, they pay for our education. They're critically important. I think we just have to be responsible and go through this process and then talk about it as Canadians, British Columbians, and move forward. Don't, don't cut away I, from the Greens. I would just like to clarify the, the Green position. We are not advocating that we cut off uh, all access to the tar sands immediately. We are going to wean ourselves from our dependence on a single source of energy. There is more investment in the world in low carbon energy than there is now in fossil fuels. Well, some of those levels. As I've been advocating through this campaign, we believe strongly that we need a carbon tax, and a carbon tax will reshape the Canadian economy and make it a 21st century economy less dependent on fossil fuels. But in the meantime, we need to be smart about how we harvest our resources and the regulatory process about how we harvest them and transport them. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, this time we're going to uh, speak with uh, Mehdi. Mehdi, uh, good morning. Uh, oh, I'm going to see if I can punch it up. Mehdi, good morning. I'm going to have to get to it. Mehdi, good morning. Welcome to. CPAC 1070, your question for our candidates this morning. Good, good morning, Stephen. I am concerned that, you know, we are living in a prosperous country, but the fact that child poverty numbers coming out all the time, and it really put us to shame. We should not have child poverty in this country. My question, I'm a member of NDP, and my question is, why is it, uh, asking question for Mary Rankin, for 12 
against the other NDP government in Manitoba and the child poverty in Manitoba is the worst. Why they are giving tax cuts to corporations and, and so, the, so they don't, the government has, do not have money to spend on the issue of child poverty. Why should we continue vote for NDP when we see no changes in 12 years? They are the worst in the country in terms of child poverty. Okay, thanks for your call, Manny. Appreciate it. Let's uh, go to uh, Murray. This question for you, first of all, and right. then uh, everyone jump in after 20 seconds. It's tragic, as we heard just this week, uh, that one in seven children in Canada live in poverty. That means one in seven families live in poverty. And I think my goal as a federal politician would be to collaborate better with the provincial governments because, of course, they deliver services, frontline services, to children in poverty. First Nations. Of course, responsible is the federal government. We need to work uh, closely with them. I'm committed to a Poverty Reduction Act that so many provinces of all political stripes have, except the Conservatives don't want to uh, admit this is a critical uh, problem in our country. Paul Somerville. Canada spends uh, about $130 billion a year on welfare and supports, and our child poverty outcomes uh, over the last 15 years have got worse, not better. We know that child poverty results in bad education, health, and economic outcomes for those children. We need a guaranteed annual income. A guaranteed annual income would be part of an important uh, framework to instantly remove income poverty. So what would you, how would that work uh, for those that aren't familiar with guaranteed income? Well, it's actually based on the, the research uh, of Milton Friedman, the right-wing economist. He has something called the negative income tax. So instead of building a huge bureaucracy to manage the moral hazard uh, of welfare, where you've got welfare workers running around finding out where people, uh, who they live with and where they're working or not, uh, you instead pass it through the tax system. It's much more efficient and it removes federal bureaucracy. Phil this is paternalism, maternalism doesn't work. You're reinforcing, you're deliberately reinforcing maladaptive passive behavior. And if you understand a process, you understand it can't work. So what are you suggesting then, Philip? I mean, do we, do we just leave these people to struggle for themselves, or do we try to help them? We need more children. More children create real jobs. More children could be more children in child poverty, and that just doesn't make sense. I'm asking you, what are we going to do with the people that are on welfare now? Well, Let's say that you have a, a gay couple that are out there, um, and uh, they're, they're in a situation where they're, they're not maybe surviving. Do, do we ask them to go out and have more children? I mean, you, 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 your plan you doesn't seem to be... Are you an advocate? I'm asking you questions. I mean, I'm not just a moderator. I'm the host of this talk show, and I'm asking you a question. If you want to answer the question, go ahead. If you don't, that's I'll fine. I'll answer the question. You don't understand that people are an asset. Always, in every country. You go to the Philippines, Bill Clinton said, people are an asset. Do not get rid of your people. We need more children. Children create jobs, believe it or not. OK, but what I'm saying to you is, what do you do with people on welfare now? Do you, do you help them, or do you just leave them to fend for yourself? No, That's the question more, I'm asking. Get them more welfare, it never works. Right. Okay, let's go to uh, Dale Gann. Okay. All right, uh, as an individual um, that's lived here, and, 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 and uh, we just had a homeless conversation recently, $900 is not an, enough of an annual, or a monthly income for anyone. You can't live and have a home and have food and live with $900. Right now, one of our senators, Hugh Siegel, is, is advocating a plan for this guaranteed income, and we're on them, and we should get behind them. It's tough. It requires all levels of government to come together, and I support this principle. The other important thing is we got to higher our education levels, and we got to bring those kids onto the bring opportunities to those kids and show. We got to just. This is so important. It's absolutely important. Um, but nine hundred dollars is not enough for a single mom or family. And what about uh, so individuals? Yeah, individuals. Are you just talking about families or individuals? No, individuals. Okay, let's go to the you know, uh, go to Donald Gallery. Can I get Can I get back to Mehdi's question? And that is, why is it that the worst uh, situation is in a province where we have a socialist government? And I think that the the nature of the question suggests that in fact we are failing on this question, no matter how. Uh, how positive we are in terms of protecting social rights. And I would suggest that our failure is because we don't see ourselves as others see us. Others see us as 24th on the list of 35 countries. Others, such as the Committee on Rights of the Child, see us as failing to deal with Aboriginal uh, children, African-Canadian children, the disabled. We need infrastructure to build a success. Paul Summerhouse. 
the reality is we've got to go for a break. The reality is, Don, is I've heard you at a whole bunch of these uh, conferences, and you're the socialist. You know, you're the one who wants to shut down resource industries and prevent, uh, through a moratorium or a complete blockage of pipelines, resources going to the to the global economy. Your 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 strategies on the economy would be a disaster for Canada. Or right. Manitoba is a province with a very large Aboriginal population. The federal government has not stepped up and found creative solutions to deal with Aboriginal poverty in this country, and that's a crying shame. To talk, as, this, as my conservative opponent just did, about $900 being a, not, dollars not being enough, I remind him that that's a provincial responsibility. The federal government's Canadian social transfer gets less and less every year to help the provinces. More taxes. So, again, it means a very good question. Where is the conservative government on this? Well, it, I, I just give you an example. I just give you an example that we have a senator in our country fighting for for that. Hey, Dan, that, show Dan, me the money, Dan. That's that's not conservative policy. That's uh, really out there. And I mean, I'm glad that Hugh Siegel's taking that position on a guaranteed annual income, but it's never been part of Harper's plan for Canada. Try and get more taxes from a declining population. It can't happen. Philip Nay, and finally Donald Galloway. Then I got to take a break. I would just like to. Uh, correct is that the, the statements uh, as the so-called socialist here, uh, the Green Party uh, actually advocates the guaranteed annual income as well. But we don't want to just throw money at poverty, we want to deal with it in terms of institutions. We need to make some money right now, we'll do that, be back with our candidates. <laughs> <laughs> On CFAX 1070. Five of the candidates running to be the next uh, MP in Ottawa for Victoria are in our studio. I should mention that uh, our local libertarian is sick today, cannot be with us. We're going to get back to the phones right now. We are going to go over and uh, chat with, uh, let me see who pick up here, Eric. Uh, Eric, good morning. Welcome to CFAX 1070. Go ahead with your question, sir. Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very curious. I've seen the, the welfare system firsthand. Uh, Let's go to uh, Dale Gannon and get you to answer that question first. What's your policy welfare issues? What can, I guess, the federal government do to uh, encourage maybe the provinces to, to revamp the welfare system? Well, obviously, what we've seen provincially is not working. We've just uh, talked in the last few days about a report that isn't, uh, that is alarming, obviously. And so uh, it has to be a concern for uh, citizens in our community. And, uh, I think that it has to be voiced into Ottawa, and we have to work to see if we can get a better transfer of funds for from the feds to the Do you think that's possible? Well, I mean, you know, just, I mean, well the option of leaving, leave, uh, the current status is not good. The report card is bad. So yeah, we got to get on with it. We're a caring nation. We, yeah, it's not good enough. No, it's not about your parties. I mean, the, the provinces have complained about your parties. Uh, Funding of health care. I mean, and they, the, the provinces do, the finance ministers obviously uh, meet on a regular basis to say that the Conservative government hasn't really stepped up to the plate to the level that they need to deal with things such as health care. Obviously, if that creates more of a burden on provincial budgets, then they have to look to other areas to make cuts. Our, the federal government is committed to the provincial government, its funding for five years, with an annual 6% increase. Health care is one of the greatest concerns to our nation, the rising cost of it. To our communities, it's it's challenging, but let's let's be sure and know this, the, the the listeners, the federal government is committed to five years so that you can plan your health care in British Columbia with an, an, an annual six percent increase. Donald Galloway from the Greeks. Uh, as I pointed out the other night in the uh, large omnibus budget that went through last session, the only reference to poverty was in the cancellation of a, not, uh, a national welfare advisory group. Uh, whose job it was to advise the government on how to spend monies in this regard. I think that the government is clearly cutting back on social services, and I think that the job of the MP is to hold them to account, to expose what they're doing, and to expose the way in which they, they are wasting funding as well. The federal government has what they call a, the Canada Social Transfer. They make block transfers to uh, provincial governments, and they don't 
uh, they don't uh, uh, enforce the rules. You mentioned, Stephen, the, Canadian, the Canada Health Act. Excellent statute, clear principles. The government of Canada doesn't enforce those rules. So when a provincial government like Christy Clark's decides to stand up for a two-tier Medicare system, I'm going to stand up to Harper and demand that they enforce the Canada Health Act. That's just one example. All right, and now to uh, Paul Somerville. The best uh, welfare systems need to be designed as a hand up, not a handout. And what we need to do is change our tax system so that people who are on assistance can then go into the workforce, if they're capable and able, to earn money that isn't immediately taxed at the top tax rate. So one of the things we've been advocating along with the guaranteed annual income is that the next $5,000 in income, earned income is tax free. Right now what's happening is that first dollar that's earned is taxed at the top marginal rate. What you want to do is draw people out of the poverty trap, which welfare creates, and open the door to the middle class. Philip May from the Christian Heritage. Well, it's not as easy as you think. I don't know if people understand condition passivity. You give money or attention for sick, helpless behavior. You can't even diagnose a healthy report. You don't get paid for it. So we've got to encourage people to take charge of their health. We've got to encourage people, and it's not so hard, to take charge of their welfare. The welfare system has never worked anywhere. It deepens our debt. That means that people are out of job, and the whole thing spirals downward. We can only do it differently. My party is different. Anyone else want to make a comment? Okay, done. Um, let's talk about the economy right now. Uh, a little, bit, a little bit more. Obviously, I think one of the one of the biggest issues that faces us right now is the pressure of budgets. So I'm going to start. I'm going to go reverse order. We'll start with you, Paul Somerville. What primary budget measure do you think that your government could bring in that could make a change that your party could bring in? And I need to give you each about maybe 34 seconds. Well, one of the things uh, that I talked about when I was chief economist of RBC Dominion, Canada's largest uh, investment bank, was the need to design. Uh, a tax system which steers the economy in a way that's environmentally uh, and economically responsible. And so there are a few things uh, that I've been talking about in addition to sewage. Uh, number one uh, is a carbon tax. We need to create a 21st century green economy that reduces its dependency on fossil fuels uh, because of climate change. Uh, we need to uh, legalize, uh, regulate, commercialize, and tax marijuana, which could raise, incidentally, about half a billion dollars a year here in BC alone. Let's go to Mark Rankin. I believe that we have a vibrant $2 billion a year knowledge economy now in this city, and I salute the people who are the leaders that produced that result. We've got to build on it. The driver of our job creation has always been small business, and that's proving to be the case in Victoria. The New Democrats have advocated for a 2% cut in small business tax, and we stand by that. The last thing I'd say, Stephen, is Denise Savoie successfully introduced a small uh, a, a private member's bill that the real estate board here had encouraged called a capital gains rollover to incite or to incent people to produce rental housing. I think that would really, really be a boost uh, for our economy as well. Philip You look the world over and you'll find every economy in the world is going down as their population goes down. Population and economy go together. You need more children. There's no other solution. And killing children by abortion does not help because abortions are damaging to the women, check the science, and certainly don't help the economy. Okay, let's go to uh, Dale Gain. Well, I'm really glad that we've had this question. It's one of the first times in this all Canada debate we finally talk about jobs in the economy and Victoria. For one that's been a champion for this region, internationally, nationally, and locally, about job creation, I'm very happy we're finally talking about something that is so fundamentally important. And I thank you for the question. Um, listen, I, I, uh, I know this, that we as a community here in Victoria do not have Agreed, shared economic plan, and that is unacceptable. This region must get on and create our plan and align it with our government. Our government has put us in a fine, strong financial position. It has stated a key priority jobs in the economy and small business. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the priority of our backyard. That's a problem. We see too many vacancy signs. Let's go to uh, Don Galloway, the Greens. For the Green Party, I think that uh, the budget changes would be first for the generation of re revenue. We need carbon pricing, absolutely clearly. The person who causes the mess should pay for it. In 
terms of the, uh, the spending of the revenue generated, we have to have a housing department, we have to have sufficient uh, funding dedicated in the social transfer to social services, particularly the, need, the needs of the vulnerable, such as the elderly. I want to be very clear, it's Paul Somerville, that the, the, the most important strategic asset that Canada has is its people. Uh, and that Canada's population is growing a little more than 1% on an average annual basis, which will result in 50 million Canadians by 2050, a current trend. In fact, there'll be more Canadians than Germans by 2080. We need to have a thoughtful and engaged immigration strategy. Joe Grant, I agree with the immigration point, but listen, this is what I'm concerned about for Victoria. We rely on a government town, a tourist town, and a knowledge-based town supported by the best post-secondary education system other However, countries in the world, sorry. Philip, no, we, we're going to move on, sorry. Philip, no. Other countries in the world resent us taking away their best brains, and they are angry about that. Besides which, they all have a uh, exponentially declining fertility rate. So it's going to grow, it's going to dry it up. We've got to have our own children. Okay. Let's uh, quickly go down, Galway, if we can get to the road again. Well, as the uh, immigration lawyer here, I think I want to say, of course, integration is a serious matter, and we have to do it properly. We have to take discretion away from the minister who thinks he knows best and actually go back to a system that tailors our needs to the, the, the gaps. I'm very quickly, you have to give me 10 seconds here. Our government has a jobs plan. I've been a champion for creating jobs, and I want to know where the NDP jobs plan is. I've not heard it or read it. Okay, now we're going to have more questions when we come back at 250-386-1161, star 1070. Another half hour of this town hall forum. And then and, uh, if you would like to email me questions, talk at cfax1070.com. When we return from the break, each candidate in this room will have an opportunity to pose a question to another candidate. Find out what that is and how the candidate responds right after the news. Good morning. Thanks for staying with us. Frank Sanford will be with you at 10.30 this morning. Right now we're continuing with our All Candidates Forum here live in our CPAX 1070 in the CTV News studios at Broad and Pandora. If you would like to join the conversation this morning, the phone number to dial 250-386-1161, star 1070. Just a reminder, the candidates that are here today, they are again from the Conservative Party, Donald Galloway from the Greens, Philip May from the Christian Heritage Party, Aaron Rankin from the New Democrats, and Paul Somerville from the Liberals. The candidate is not present with us, but is still running. He was sick today, couldn't join us. It's part of love from the Libertarian Party. Before the break, I ask you to select a question that uh, you can ask of any other candidate. We're going to start uh, this session with Don Galloway from the Greens. Don, who's your question for? I have a question for Marty Rankin. And the question is this What would you do if your party leader? strong disciplinarian required you to vote in a way that you believed was counter to the interests of your representatives, your constituents in Victoria? The premise of the question is that uh, I would be voting against the interests of my constituents in Victoria were I uh, successful in this campaign. I would not vote against the interests of my constituents. I accept that part of party discipline is part of our, our parliamentary process, part of our traditions as Canadians. However, I believe that it's important that I represent the interests of Victoria and stand up for Victoria in Ottawa. Let me ask a follow-up question on that. I'm going to try and do that. Let's say you're put into really a kind of a very tough situation. It's either voting to keep your party in power mm -hmm. or voting with your interests of your constituents. Which way would you go? If I have listened to the people of Victoria, consulted widely, and, and if the premise of your question is that they all are opposed to the position that I would be required to take, I would have to, I would have to resign, or I would have to, you know, I would have to take steps to address that. In other words, I would want to listen first to ensure that there really was that conflict that you've talked about. Okay. Now we're going to go to Paul Somerville. Your question, and who is it for? This, uh, this by-election uh, isn't going to change our Prime Minister or Parliament, uh, but it's become a referendum on the sewage issue uh, because it's so important. So this is a question from Mary Rankin. Uh, about a month ago, uh, on uh, Stephen Andrews' show, uh, along with Don Galloway, uh, you were asked about the terrible tax impact for families and businesses here in Victoria, and you responded by saying, it wasn't your problem. Are you prepared to apologize to the people of Victoria for what is probably a heartless comment. <laughs> I apologize if that were the 
quote uh, accurately perceived. I suspect it was taken out of context, but look, let me tell you my position. I want this to be the most cost-effective plan possible. It is not the federal government's plan. I'm seeking federal office. It's the plan of a regional district trying to comply with provincial and then federal laws. I will work hard to make it the most cost-effective and environmentally acceptable plan possible. Murray, you can't hide behind legal mumbo-jumbo. If you go to my website, we have it clearly there where you say it's not my problem, period. Okay. Do, is it possible you said that? I probably did, but if so, it was out of context. Of course, everything is the federal government's problem, ultimately, but listen, this plan is a plan that is in response to a federal and, of course, initially a B.C. liberal government requirement. That still is the law. I'm sorry if I, I'm not apologizing for being a lawyer. Those are the legal facts of life. The reality is that you had the chance to sympathize with the businesses and people in Victoria who are going to be so harmed by the sewage well, tax increase, and what you said was it wasn't your problem. I even gave you a chance a couple weeks later when I mentioned to you on air that I thought that Tom Walker, under Tom Walker's leadership that the NDP had lost its soul. If I could just, Again, so I'm just quickly wrap this up, guys, because we want to get other people This is a chance to okay. apologize. Last comment to Murray Lorenzo. I am so pleased that the Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Victoria have joined with environmental organizations to stand up okay, and say we need secondary to Let's go to Philip May. Philip, who's your question for? I'd like to ask all my fellow candidates. Well, you, you get to ask one. One candidate. Do you support? Is he go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> do you support uh, the UN document Agenda 21 and the use of abortion to create this depopulation and globalization? I will need to know, I'll know a lot more about uh, Agenda United Nations documents, but I can tell you that our party has proudly been pro-choice from the get-go and stood up recently unanimously, contrary to other parties, against Rona Ambrose's position on that. In spite of what science says. Okay, let's go to um, Dale Gann. Your question, who is it for? Um, this question is for Murray Rankin. It seems um, that Murray is the one to knock off today. Well, I've listened to this radio sto uh, station for a long time as a kid that grew up here, and uh, for the last 10 years, I've, I've uh, wondered what the uh, economic priority, what the economic plan of the NDP government is. I think it's the most important. I think Victoria has a chance to elect a member to the table of the uh, sitting government, and I'd like to know, Murray, yes. what your plan is, what your party's plan is to strengthen in our economy. Is there one minute uh, question? Okay. Well, let me just say that I was a, uh, a managing partner of a very successful small business, a law firm in this community, for over a dozen years. A job plan is not like Christy Clark's job plan, which is spin and political advertising. A job plan is standing up and ensuring that we have value, a value-added economy, and not inciting uh, temporary foreign workers, but rather finding jobs for Canadians. Not shipping our jobs to Asia via a pipeline that your party supports. Can I ask you a follow-on question then? Why is it that your leader um, opposed a $3,000 tax credit for a small business to hire a new hire when they're trying to create more revenue out there in the streets? It's I not acceptable. I'm all for, for looking constructively at tax incentives. I mentioned the capital gains so rollover as one that your party did not support, despite the Nice Savoy and the real estate board being in favor. Well, hang on, that I mean, very stuff would make a great difference in this local economy. You've just, been, Mars, you've just been asked a question. You've done just the political thing. Right. Dale, I'll ask you a question again, and this time we're going to get an answer. The question? Simply put, what is the NDP's job plan to strengthen Canada's economy and Victoria's? 2% tax cut for small business. That has been one of the main planks in the last uh, campaign, and I stand by that. Uh, Murray Rankin, you get to ah, ask a question. Me. Well, I'll ask Mr. Gann then. Uh, and as you know, Mr. Gann, the Conservatives' omnibus budget bill repealed the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act and replaced it by a much weaker statute. How does this relate to the pipeline projects in British Columbia? Well, I'm going to say that um, what I know about what they've done um, is they've tried to, to streamline it. And if you use the word streamline it, everybody all of a sudden gets concerned and says we're not doing it thoroughly. What I know is I've watched business and engineering firms try to bring projects to increase and do things in a responsible way, but the prior process was so encumbered, so lengthy, that it took so long for us to get a darn project done that it's stymied production of jobs and ultimate projects. I need to take a break when we come back. 
my tough questions for each of these candidates. So you're going to want to hear them and uh, their answers and see if they're going to buckle under the pressure when we continue here on Super Fast 10 Seconds. Welcome back to the program. I'm going to make sure that we get one quick call in for the five candidates that are here in our studio. We're going to do that right now. I'm going to go to John in Victoria. John, good morning. Welcome to CPAC 1070. Very quickly, sir, your question for our candidates. Okay, here's the question. Canada's economy seems to be doing quite well throughout the world, yet Europe's economy is falling apart. What, why, what has happened to Europe? What is the problem? Okay, well, uh, I'll give you each about maybe 10 seconds on it's, that. Dale Gann? It's very, oh, it's very, oh, sorry. Dale, changing your name, Paul. Sorry. Let's go to Dale Gann. <laughs> Listen, you're right, sir, on, uh, and thank you for the call. Um, Canada's economy is doing well, and obviously we've just watched the International Monetary Fund chief just say it's a model financially for the world. Um, I think we have to recognize that and be proud of that. Um, we live in a global economy, and it's a tough economy. Uh, we need to steward it very well. Paul Somerville from the Liberals. It's very simple. The Europeans have built a monetary and fiscal program that don't work. Uh, and they've, they've backed themselves into disaster. Let's go to Donald Gallery from the Green Party. The amount of personal debt that is being incurred by individuals in Europe is beyond the means of the countries to look after. Let's go to Philip Ney from the Christian Heritage Party. A uh, question obviously on why is uh, Europe's economy failing when, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when Canada's economy seems to be booming. The Prime Minister of Hungary went on record to say, Europe must return to Christianity before economic regeneration is possible. And finally, Murray Rankin. I think it, it, it's, um, it's grounded as well in the failure to agree on stimulus programs and having a great dissension at the, at the EU level on what exactly should be done. Okay, tough questions uh, for you now, very briefly, and I need each of you to really get tough on this. We'll go to Paul Somerville. Um, your Achilles heel, a couple of days. I'm, uh, I'm a very private person, and uh, this is a very, very public profession. And I think uh, by, being very, by being very private, there are times when uh, I want to say what I think, and I'm going to have to learn to think about it more carefully. Philip Day, your Achilles heel in this campaign. I'm sorry. Your Achilles heel, your weakness in this campaign. Oh, my Achilles heel. Uh, I have taken a very consciously a different and, in some areas, unpopular. But it is still strongly scientific. I'm a scientist. I publish scientific papers. People don't want to talk about abortion, but it's underlying all we'll sorts get to of that. problems. We'll get to that in a minute. Roy Rankin? I, I think um, I have a lot of faults, for sure. Uh, but my uh, um, following on the, in the footsteps of someone as popular as Denise Savoie and having a big uh, hard act to follow is something I hear about all the time on the doorsteps. That's your Achilles heel. Well, I guess yeah, I mean, so I'm what you're saying is I, I, you, you can't measure up to Denise Savoie. I worry, I worry about that perception for sure. And I'm also uh, obviously worried about the, the toll on personal life in a job like this. It's tough. I guess I yeah, that. I, I watch it on the other side. Dale Gann? Um, I, I'm... Uh, I guess, you know, I'm an individual that uh, has been soft taught, taught and learned and uh, I, I realize that this is a, this is a very uh, important job to represent our community and uh, you need to be able to be uh, very effective at listening and learning and leading. And is that, that your Achilles heel? No, it's not my Achilles heel, but it's incredibly important. My Achilles heel that I, I'm probably uh, running, representing a government, a standing government, and throughout this whole election it's been blamed the government and versus look at Victoria and my ability to help our our economy. So the government, your Achilles heel is your, is your government, your party. You're, you're, when you're in an elected government, it's a, it's a, is that a yes? Is that a yes? Your Achilles heel is the government. Is that a yes? Compared to my candidates, yes. <laughs> okay. I love it when people say yes and not actually give Let's go to Donald Gallagher. I've uh, committed myself to a high road campaign that is based upon principles I'm finding that there is information out there that is based upon scare tactics rather than faith. But is that your Achilles heel? Well, I think that the Achilles heel is that we know that in election campaigns, negative tactics can work. I'm refusing to go that, uh, that direction. But Donald, you're the one where you have the false endorsement by David Suzuki. I know materials. Pardon? David, I had, Suzuki I was, had, David Suzuki was falsely identified as an endorser on your materials. He came out to his front page column in the Times columnist. You've been doing the hot, you know, the high road campaign, 
and yet you're the one who's falsely used one of Canada's icons to support your party. I have had David Suzuki support at a uh, stated support at a rally in which he des described me as a dedicated individual, a, that the Green Party was lucky to have me as their candidate. He went out of his way to state that he supported me. Donald so Trump page article. So what, what, what has the Times columnist got it wrong? You know, has David Suzuki changed his mind? Since I then? think that there is an issue about David Suzuki having a uh, a uh, concern about the use of the term endorsement as opposed to the use of the term support. David Suzuki made some. So very he, he doesn't endorse you, but he supports. But he that supports me. That I think is my position, and I didn't pick up in the early dealings with him that he actually drew this distinction. You endorse a project, you support a person. Okay. David Suzuki clearly comes out, and it's on YouTube. You can hear the things that he says about me as a candidate. He clearly states. Let's go. You want to talk about abortion? Okay, let's do it. I understand that you are not pro-choice. Is that true? That's not true. You can't stop people choosing. That's ridiculous. They can choose to end. I can't stop them. That's not the point. The point is that the vast majority of Canadians don't support abortion on demand. And yet they have to pay taxes for a bad medical procedure. You want to look at the science? Universal. So would you stop? Me? If, you, if you were elected and your party, the Christian Heritage Party, the Canadian government, would they stop abortion? Uh, don't be silly. I mean, what you're I'm doing. I'm not being silly. I'm asking you a question, sir. I'm going to ask you a question if you'd be quiet. I am for the practice of good medicine. If it's good for women, I support it. And if it's a good and necessary abortion, I'll do it myself. But the uh, findings are very clear. Abortion interferes with the development of subsequent children. They have more okay. birth weights and so subsequent. Let me ask you a direct question then, uh, Philip. If a woman decided, became pregnant, decided for no other reason that she really did not want to carry the child to term, should that be allowed? I'm a doctor. What do I say if somebody says I want to cut my arm off? I say it's not good for you. I'm not going to do that. It's ridiculous. There's nothing necessary about having, and when we do a study on wanting babies, it increases during the pregnancy. Do you know that? Uh, so uh, even I'm obviously not going to get a straight answer to my question. Paul Somerville, women's right to choose. 100% uh, support. Bernard, you've already said they support. 100% support. Dale Gann? It's a personal issue. Um, and uh, you, your example of, of a mother getting um, in that situation, um, gee, I, you know, having, the, having the, that's a personal issue. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see someone have to be forced to have that baby. But you would take no steps to, to make it illegal? Um, I would take this first step as your elected MP to talk to the citizens and ask what they want to do. It's pretty clear, uh, Dale, that most women support the right over their own bodies, for goodness sakes. Not as much as men. Yeah. No answer to that, Dale, No, I made my point. Okay, all right. 100%. 100%. Okay, I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to make a statement. You have to be different. Okay, uh, 30 seconds. So we'll start with Paul Somerville, and I'll just let you know when you got uh, uh, 10 seconds uh, to wrap up. Okay, Paul? Thank you, Victoria, for having the chance uh, to speak to you. This, this by-election is not going to change a prime minister, uh, and it's not going to change parliament. It's become a referendum on a wasteful sewage treatment plant, and it's very simple. A vote for Paul Somerville is a vote to stop the billion-dollar boondoggle, and a vote for Murray Rankin is for it to continue with the terrible tax increases that will push business and people out of our city. Thank you, Paul Somerville, representing the Liberal Party of Canada. We are now going to move on to... Murray Rankin, who is representing the New Democrats. 30 seconds for you. The, gov the government of Canada is led by Stephen Harper. His values are not our values. I do not believe that fighter jets over $20 billion, cuts of $36 billion to Medicare, denying climate change action, or gutting our environmental legislation are our values. I want to represent Victoria in Ottawa, not the other way around, and stand up to him every day in the House of Commons. Thank you, Barry Rankin. Uh, just uh, so you know, when I do the, the second we have 10 seconds left. Barry Rankin from uh, the NDP. Now we go to Philip Name for the uh, Christian Heritage Party. You have 30 seconds. The wise man said, listen most carefully for what you do not want to hear. And I say to my people, my friends in Victoria, truly, you know me. I have stood up for unpopular things all since 
I was an elected position in the school board. I've done that, and I've done very unpopular things, but they are scientific and they are pragmatic. Listen to what medical science has to say and what economics has to say. We cannot run a free market economy on a declining population. That's it. No more taxes. All my friends are for more taxes. Thank you. It will not work. Philip okay. Nathan, Christian Heritage. Now go to uh, Donald Gallery from the Green Party. Donald, 30 seconds. I would like the opportunity to work alongside the most effective, most popular politician and political leader in Canada, the one who took the lead dealing with the omnibus budget bills and the China-Canada investment agreement. I am asking the people of uh, Victoria to be bold, to have faith, because on November the 27th, there will be joy in your heart if you vote for Greens. Thank you, Donald Gallery. And our final candidate here in the studio is uh, Dale Gann from the Conservatives. Dale, you have 30 seconds starting now. An election is not about a day, it's about a future. I have demonstrated that I am a champion for this community. I have discussed throughout my campaign the opportunities, not just the issues, how to strengthen our economy and how to work with our government. We may not always agree with them, but we must learn to work with governments. I am the best representative for this job. I have put a lot of thought in this, and I have a proven track record. I look forward to your vote. Thank you. Thank you, all candidates. We are out of time. I do appreciate it. Vote on Monday.